What happens when men begin doing what is right in their own eyes? A bizarre story from the Word of God next on Let the Bible Speak. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Evangelist Kevin Presley. What happens when a generation or society loses its values, uh, loses its morals? Well, there's a very strange story in the Old Testament that illustrates not only how that happens, but what happens when it does. It's recorded in the book of Judges, and this was a very dark and bizarre period of time in the history of God's people anyway. And this story is tucked away in the 17th chapter, beginning in the 17th chapter of Judges. And I want to read several verses here, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, And there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah. And he said unto his mother, The eleven hundred shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears, well, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the eleven hundred shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now therefore I will restore it unto thee. Yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took two hundred shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image. And they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now the story doesn't stop there, but when you read merely that much, it really makes you stop and scratch your head. What in the world is going on here? You have a family that claims to serve the Lord, but in the process of serving the Lord, you have stealing, covetousness, and perhaps worst of all, idolatry. Here's the story of a young man of the people of God who really founded his own religion. He built a shrine in his house full of idols. Well, there are a number of timely lessons that we learn from the story of Micah. And they are lessons that point to what's happening in our day and age in the hearts of men. And the key to the whole thing is found there in Judges 17 and verse 6, where the Bible says, Every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. We want to learn about that today as we talk about the religion of Micah. The psalmist said, Through thy precepts I get understanding. The Bible is the revelation of God to man. And you simply can't live for God until you know something about the Word of God. And you may say, Well, I want to read and study the Bible, but I don't know where to begin. I feel overwhelmed or I don't understand the Bible. I want to offer you a wonderful way to get acquainted with the Scriptures. You'll learn about some of the most basic and foundational teachings of God's Word and you'll get a better handle on how to read and approach and study the Bible as a whole. Won't you get in touch with us today and ask to be enrolled in the Bible Correspondence Course. It won't cost you a penny, and we'll mail the lessons to your home, and you take your time to read and study through the lessons. I think you'll be surprised how much you'll learn. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV.
The book of Judges describes a very dark era in the history of the nation of Israel. God's people had lost their way. And Samuel tells us why in Judges 17 and verse 6, when he said, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, although no man had been appointed as king over the people, Israel did have a king, and that is the Lord God. God wanted to be their king. But they had rejected the Lord as king in that they had rejected the Lord's authority. They had set God's law aside, and they were making moral and spiritual determinations based upon their own thinking and their own evaluation instead of listening to what God had said within His law. Every man became a law unto himself. Well, you might say that you had a postmodern generation living back in that ancient day because the same philosophy that ruled that day rules this one. And I'm convinced that were the prophet Samuel to write a history of God's people today as he did the pre-monarchical Jews back then, he might very well use the same words that every man did that which is right in his own eyes, because that's what we're confronted with day in and day out. And that is, well, what's right for you is right for you, and what's right for me is right for me, that there is no absolute standard of truth. Uh, there is no objective standard of truth outside of every person, autonomous person. Uh, and so, uh, therefore, my truth is my truth, and your truth is your truth, and don't try to make me live by your truth, and I won't make you live by my truth. And that postmodern philosophy has resulted in all kinds of moral and spiritual decay and confusion and anarchy today, just like it did back in the days of the judges. Now, Samuel not only tells us that men were doing what was right in their own eyes, he illustrates for us the confusion that resulted from that philosophy. And he illustrates it by introducing us to the story of Micah. Now, Micah was a thief. Micah was a dishonest man, a covetous man. But perhaps worst of all, Micah was an idolater. And the Bible tells us in Judges chapter 17 that uh, he had gone in and stolen 1,100 shekels of silver from his mother. He had stolen a lot of money from his mother. And when she came to see that the money was missing, she was very upset about that. And she pronounced a curse upon whoever the thief was. She didn't know her own son had stolen her money. She pronounced a curse upon the thief. Well, when Micah found out that she had done that, he brought the money back and admitted what he had done. Now, he didn't do that out of genuine contrition and repentance. Uh, he did that out of fear. He was worried about what his mother was going to do. And so he brings the money back, and he tells her that he was the thief. And, and this is where the story gets very strange. You would think that at the very least... She would be angry with him. She might scold him. She would resent him for what he did. But oh no, the Bible says that she blessed him. She blessed him. And she goes on to explain to him why she was so concerned about this money. Because she had set it aside for a very special purpose. She tells Micah that she had dedicated this money to the Lord God. Well, now that sounds good. I mean, wouldn't we think that here is an upstanding, virtuous woman of God who has set aside this large sum of money to dedicate to God and do His service? But wait until you hear how she had dedicated that money to God. Her intention was to take that money and have an idol made out of that silver. An idol. And so she turns all of this over to Micah they take this money down there to the founder and they have this little idol made out of this silver and it's given to Micah and he takes it back to his house and he just puts it on his shelf of gods. He has a house full of these teraphim, these house gods. He has a shrine of idols that he is building and um, he decides that he's going to appoint a priest to officiate over all of this and so he just appoints his own son to be the priest in his house of idols. Now, whatever that is, it is absolute moral and spiritual confusion. I mean, when I read that story, I just simply scratch my head and think, what in the world? What could these people have been thinking 
that would lead them to believe that they could construct an idolatrous shrine of idols and somehow that is attached to uh, God and to the worship of God and the service of God, that God would receive that. But as strange as that may sound to us, it really shouldn't sound all that unfamiliar. Because let me tell you, religion today is steeped in idolatry. And when you look at religion and try to compare it to the Word of God, you're going to see a great contrast. People today do all manner of things that you can't read in the New Testament, and they do it in the name of God. They do it in the name of serving Jesus Christ. All kinds of false worship and false doctrines and false religious notions and concepts that have no foundation in God's Word. And yet in all of this, people claim to be serving the Lord. Folks, it's not that we don't have religion today. We're drowning in religion today, but we're drowning in false religion. There's very little Bible truth. I mean, when you get right down to it, there is very little Bible authority cited for what people believe and practice in religion today. Why? Well, for one reason, many people are guided by their emotions. Uh, many people use their emotions as their authority in religion, their feelings human tradition, all of these other things besides the Word of God serve as their authority in religion. And it's no different than what was going on back in the days of the judges. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And whenever you take the Word of God and you set it aside, whenever you say that this no longer is the absolute authority and standard for morality, spirituality, doctrine, worship, and so forth, when this fails to be the standard, what do you have? Whose Word do you go by? Uh, what constitutes the authority. You see, the only thing that we could ever all possibly rally around as the authority in religion is the revelation that God gave us of Himself and of His will, and that is the Word of God. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, John chapter 4 and verse 24. So this young man had some very strange ideas about religion, and in essence, he was setting up his own religion and in so doing was claiming to serve the Lord. And you could just go all the way back through religious history, through the history of so-called Christendom today, and you'll find where man after man and theologian after theologian has set up, has set up his own religion, his own brand of religion, and claims in it to be serving God. Well, essentially, that's what Micah had done. And it would be all uh, 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 an altogether uh, uh, sermon to itself were we to go and outline all of the kinds of idolatry that you see practiced in religion today. But that's not all that took place here. Uh, Samuel goes on with the story beginning in verse 7. Listen to this. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. Now, you remember who the Levites were? Well, the Levites were the priests of God's people. And the Levites who weren't priests were temple workers. And so for our purposes today, we'll say that these were the preachers of that day and time. And so the Bible says, here's a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, and he's, he's just out sojourning. He's out uh, traversing the countryside, uh, basically just looking to live, looking to make ends meet. He's looking for a job. He needs food to eat and clothes to wear and a place to live. And so he's out looking for gainful employment. And the Bible says in verse 8, the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. Well, we just met Micah, the thief and the idolater. And Micah said unto him, uh, Whence comest thou? Where are you from? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. Now when Micah heard the name or the word Levite, uh, he perked up. Levite. Uh, he recognized that the Levites were the priests of, uh, of God's people. And so uh, he thinks, well, this is my lucky day. I found a man that if I can just convince him to come into my house and be my priest, why, that will legitimize all of this that I've set up. This will legitimize uh, my, my, my religion. 
And that's the way a lot of people think today. You know, if they can get a preacher to go along with it, if they can find a man who calls himself or other people think of as a man of God to sanction and validate what they believe and what they do and what they practice, uh, then that ought to make it all right. And so when Micah hears that this man's a Levite, he thinks, well, that's what I'll do. I'll just hire him to be my priest, and that will put God's seal of approval on this whole business. And so Micah approaches him with a proposition. Micah says, hey, this is your lucky day. He says in verse 10, uh, dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and thy victuals. So the Levite went in. He tells him, if you'll just come and you'll be my priest in my house of idols, uh, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pay you a handsome salary. I'll give you a fine suit of clothes. You'll eat the finest of food. I'll make sure that you are taken care of if you'll just agree to come and be my priest. And the Bible says the Levite took the job. The Levite went in. Now, what do we learn about this young man immediately? If he had any principles, he left them at the door. If he had any convictions before this point, he threw them out the window because he's concerned about one thing at this point, and that is making a living. And he becomes a prophet for profit. He becomes a preacher looking for a paycheck, and that's what it amounts to. Now, you know, the Bible teaches that preachers are to be paid for their work in preaching the gospel. The Bible teaches that. There's nothing wrong with paying a preacher. In fact, the Bible commands the church to pay the preacher who labors amongst them. Uh, and uh, there's certainly uh, nothing wrong with a preacher feeling a sense of being accountable to the church that supports him in the preaching of the gospel. He needs to do what he agrees to do and be honest and forthright and uh, keep whatever agreement that he makes with those people who secure his work as an evangelist or a preacher working amongst them. But you know, whenever you have a preacher who begins to look at preaching merely as a career, when you have a preacher who looks at preaching as a job, and when you have a church, on the other hand, who looks at a preacher as somebody that they can hire to come and do their bidding, well, you have a recipe for trouble. And that's exactly what this arrangement amounted to with this young Levite and Micah. In fact, uh, this young Levite met some men uh, a little bit later in the very next chapter, and they recognized the voice of this young man. At least they recognized that he was of the, the, the Levites. They recognized where he was from. And, and they said, what are you doing here? How did you end up in this place, in the house of Micah? And he, he tells them the story, how he got there. And he said, thus and thus deedeth Micah with me, and hath hired me, and I am his priest. Judges chapter 18 and verse 4. Well, you remember what Jesus said about a hireling in John chapter 10? Jesus said of the hireling, the hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and he careth not for the sheep. Now, folks, that's one of the things that's wrong, terribly wrong in religion today. Preaching has merely become a profession. Preachers are after a paycheck. Preachers look at their job of preaching as a, merely a career. And as a result, they preach to get a crowd. They preach whatever's necessary to build up a great big church. They preach whatever they think they have to preach in order to remain gainfully employed and popular. But a preacher is not true to his calling if that's his motivation. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. What the world needs today are men who stand behind pulpits who love Jesus and men who are not ashamed of the truth, men who love the Word of God, men who realize that they will give an account for what they preach and for what they don't preach, and men who realize that eternal souls hang in the balance. And it doesn't matter whether what he preaches is popular or unpopular. He simply preaches the Word of God. He's true to principle. He's true to his convictions. He's true to the Word of God. This young man, this young Levite wasn't. He sold out in order to get a paycheck. And we learn more about that in Judges chapter 18. We see more about uh, exactly this philosophy that was ruling this time, what it did to the people spiritually and morally. In Judges 18 beginning in verse 1, 
Samuel introduces us to some men from the tribe of Dan who come along and they meet this young Levite. And these men from Dan are out on a mission, and it's not a good mission. Uh, you see, the leaders of the tribe of Dan essentially said, we don't like what we have. They had uh, not inherited uh, territory. Uh, they had not gone and possessed their possession because of their own sin and their own neglect and their own cowardice and so forth. Uh, but they cast their eyes somewhere else, and they decided that they were going to go and take what God had given to somebody else. So you know what they did? They ended up going to the town of Laish, and they plundered that city. But before they got to Laish, they encountered this young Levite. And when they find out who he is and that he is now the priest in the house of Micah, they ask him, we want to know, you tell us as a man of God, will God bless us? Will God sanction us? Will God approve of us in what we're about to do? Now, they were not on a holy mission. They were on an immoral mission. They were going to go and plunder this defenseless city and take it over. Do you know what that young preacher told them? That young preacher said, you go right on ahead. That young preacher said, you go right on ahead and God will bless you in what you're going to do. God will be with you. He was telling them what they wanted to hear. He was telling them what they wanted to hear. He was like those whom the Bible later spoke of who would say peace when there was no peace. The Apostle Paul one time said, Am I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And you see, that's the preacher's job is to tell people what God has said, not what they want to hear. To tell people the truth of God's Word. And if a preacher won't do that, then he's not worth the salt that goes in his bread. You see, this was a time of spiritual confusion and anarchy and apostasy. Why? Because men had rejected the standard of God's law. There was no king in Israel, Samuel said, and every man was doing what was right in his own eyes. And in any subsequent generation, when men reject the word of God as the standard, then moral and spiritual confusion and apostasy will always be the result.
If you've ever visited an assembly of the Church of Christ, you've seen that it's different. No rock bands, no choirs and praise teams, no theatrical productions. That's because we believe worship is simple but profound and is according to what's revealed in God's Word. When you visit with the Church of Christ, you'll find that everybody simply sings the praise of the Lord together, congregationally. We meet around the Lord's table every Sunday to remember the body and blood of the Lord and His new covenant. We pray together, and none of that pop psychology, but sound teaching from the Word of God. Oh, and one more thing, we won't ask for your money. Members provide for the needs of the local church through a weekly collection. So forget all the hype. Come see the difference and be our honored guest today. Follow Let the Bible Speak on Twitter at LTBS TV. That's our time for today. If you would like a free printed transcript of our study on Micah, we will be happy to send it to you. Would you ask for it by the title, The Religion of Micah? And we'll get that sent off to you right away. We'll give you our contact information here in just a second. We sure appreciate you for joining us on Let the Bible Speak today. Won't you check out our website, letthebiblespeak.tv. And also be sure to like and follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We hope to meet you back here, the Lord willing, next time for Let the Bible Speak. Until then, tell someone else about the program. Have a good week, and we'll see you right back here, Lord willing, next time. Until then, may the Lord bless you. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.